City Councilor. Today is uh, Tuesday, May 8th. We are here again with part two of uh, Boston Public School operations as it pertains to dockets 0559 through 0563, orders for the fiscal year 19 operating budget, including annual appropriation for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements, as well as dockets 0564 through 0565, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to re remind folks in the chamber that this is a public hearing, both being broadcast and recorded on RCN channel 82, Comcast channel 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. Uh, at the conclusion of our uh, presentation from the department and questions and answers from my colleagues. We will take public testimony. There is a sign-in sheet to my left. Uh, we ask that you state your name, any affiliation, uh, and please check the box if you do wish to testify publicly. I am joined by several of my colleagues in order of their arrival. Uh, District City Council Frank Baker off to my left. Uh, to, off to my right, City Councilor Lydia Edwards. To my immediate right, District City Councilor Matt O'Malley. And to my immediate left, City Councilor at large, Anissa Asabi George. Um, before I let uh, hand it over to you, John and Kim, we have a member from the Boston Su Student Advisory Council, and I'm going to allow him to come up to the uh, podium over there. Um, and if you would introduce yourself and make your statement, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I am Kendra McClay, student representative of the Boston School Committee and former president of the Boston Student Advisory Council and co-program coordinator for the National Black MBE Association's Leader of Tomorrow program. I am here today to share my perspective not only on school safety, but the impact it had on my life. If you give me the moment to share a brief story with you. Drugs, gang violence, teen pregnancy, abuse, and death. This was the view I had as a young black man from the window of my grandmother's one-story home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Inside those walls, I cared for my grandmother. Inside those walls, I care for my grandmother who struggled with Alzheimer's dementia, while my mother worked 16 to 17 hours just to provide for her family. My grandmother was one of a true matriarch, um, a black Southern Baptist who managed to send seven of her eight children to college in the heat of the civil rights era. But now she was distraught. She was agitated and lost. But despite this responsibility, I remain self-sufficient in this unforgiving world, doing most of the necessary things to do, such as grocery shopping, um, her whereabouts, scheduling her doctor's appointments, and just her day-to-day -day navigations. And for me, loneliness and guilt lurked. And wrapped in this blanket of depression, I grew a passion for reading, for learning more, from expanding my knowledge. And I found security in learning. This expanded to where schools became my safe haven, a true source of comfort even when I struggled with social insecurity and chronic depression. I had teachers like Miss Howard, my sixth grade world history teacher. She saw past my issues with weight when I weighed nearly 325 pounds as a teenager um, and childhood asthma, and she supported me as a human, as someone who was worth something. I drew upon her for not only academic support, but also more professional and social growth. This was the experience I had as a Montessori student in the South. This is an experience that I wish that all students could have access to. Unfortunately, this isn't so. This experience was short-lived even for me. I was rezoned to the neighborhood school where the images of drugs, gang violence, teen pregnancy, and abuse were now reflected in my classroom as a reality. This place that which once was a safe haven was tainted. Many of the students at the school did not have the same luxuries or access to new textbooks or computers or full-time nurses as I once had. 
but most of these students didn't have Ms. Howard, the teacher that I had. They did not have a teacher or a guidance counselor to believe in them and reassure them that they are worth something, that they are somebody worth investing into. But they have, but what they did have were school police and metal detectors. They had teachers that didn't live in the neighborhood that treated them like criminals, drug dealers, and prostitutes. The only, um, per, which only perpetuated these inherent behaviors. And imagine being a young black male living under the pressures of trying to live in an environment which, culture, which cultured failure and having no emotional outlet. That's all without mentioning the trauma experience from seeing a friend shot and killed at 14 years old at a 14 year old's birthday party. With seeing children crashing openly, I mean, with childhood crushes openly discussing being molested and impregnated by her mother's boyfriend, her mother's boyfriend, or even dealing with being held at gunpoint by a peer. For students here in Boston, many of these same harsh realities, environmental factors and experiences and traumas are the same, but if not worse. And similarly to my hometown, it is only seen in communities and schools that are 90% or more um, students of color. But when, when we have zero tolerance policies, metal detectors, a 1,000 to one ratio of school psychologists, and part-time nurses spread across two to three buildings, what more can you expect other than the cycle to repeat itself? This is not the same as, this is not to say that substantial growth has not been made. Thanks to Boston, school, Boston Public Schools, we have entire departments focused on addressing equity in schools, dismantling the school to prison pipeline, social, emotional health and wellness, and closing the opportunity achievement gap for our historically marginalized students through the implementation of culturally, culturally linguistically sustaining practices, um, such as race circles, race discussions, restorative justice circles, and youth-led discussions and trainings for teachers and administration. We still have so much work to be done in breaking the cycle, which, which the cycle of institutionalized oppression. School safety in schools is not just having cops. We met with Tommy Welsh, associate superintendent to discuss school safety. Here are some of the recommendations that we created from the Boston Student Advisory Council. That BPS needs to create more support system for high school students focused on preventing, on prevention, normalizing um, proactivity for young ages, invest in more counselors, not cops, organize sharing and healing circles in classrooms, establishing safe spaces for students, training teachers on how to build trustworthy relationships with students, parents, and community members, having teacher or counselor who regularly interact with students, not just in when they fail or mess up and ask students to describe a safe school to ensure that we are giving them the resources necessary for them to thrive and become the leaders not only of tomorrow, but the leaders of today. And thank you for the time. Thank you, Keandre. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. Graduating in a couple weeks. Oh, congratulations again. John, it's a, you have the floor. How do you follow that? <laughs> um, Keandre, if you'd like to come down and, and do this for us, that would be great. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Council, very much uh, for your time again uh, this evening now uh, to present on uh, the safety service business budget as well as some other initiatives within safety services. Uh, I'm joined to my right by Kim Peltro, Executive Director of Safety thank Services you. for Boston Public Schools. Uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you. And, and before you begin, Kim, mm -hmm. I wanted to acknowledge we've been joined by uh, District City Councilor Josh Zakem. Thanks. Great. Thank you. There we go. Uh, here's our agenda for this evening. Um, we plan on uh, providing an overview of safety services. Uh, we then will want to spend some time talking about school safety audits, which have recently been conducted um, from the facility standpoint over the last few months and from a general school safety standpoint over the last couple years. In addition to that, we'll provide the council with an update on mandated school drills, as well as an update on one of our newer partnerships in the school district, uh, that with Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, we'll close by discussing trainings and protocols. Uh, both myself and Kim will be presenting to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Here is the organization chart for uh, BPS safety services. 
uh, as the Chief of Operations, this is one of the departments uh, within my purview. I'm very, very fortunate to have Kim as the uh, person at the helm of this important department. Uh, she serves as the Executive Director, as I mentioned. Uh, we're also joined tonight by key members of the safety ecosystem uh, within BPS. And I say ecosystem because it's not just those people like Rick Durini and Eric Weston from the Safety Services Department, but also people like Bob Harrington, Bob Ridlon, Eddie Murphy, Nick Sacramona, Bob Smith from the Facilities Department. And clearly those two departments have to work hand in hand on much of the work we do related to safety in schools. The org chart spells out toward the bottom uh, that we have a total of 75 different uh, officers serving within the Boston School Police. That school police unit is headed up by Eric Weston, whom I mentioned before. As you can see in the orange box to the bottom right, 68 of these officers are stationed at schools across the district including four school-based mobile officers if necessary, meaning that they can rove around where needed. Uh, lastly, we have three others providing additional roving mobile support, three members of the dispatch team, and one intelligence lieutenant. The mission of the Department of Safety Services is to provide and maintain a safe learning environment for all students, staff, and guests through daily communication and collaboration with school leaders, families, and partners. The department is comprised of 75 school police officers and a leadership team committed to proactively serving all school communities. I want to pause on a couple elements of that because the mission of safety services to a certain extent isn't just the mission of safety services but the mission of the school district as a whole. Our foremost obligation in serving the 57,000 children of Boston whom we serve is to keep them safe. As a fellow parent with four children in the schools, I expect that my children will be safe every day, so I have no choice but to make sure that other parents can have that same expectation. We need to make sure that children are safe, but also that our staff are safe and all guests or family members, visitors coming to our schools are safe. The other point that I want to accentuate within that mission statement is the mention of partners. We're very, very fortunate here in Boston to have a tight ecosystem of safety services support across multiple different agencies. We work extremely closely, and Kim can expand on this uh, when the time comes, with the Boston Police Department, the Boston Fire Department, the Mayor's Office of Safety Services, the Boston Centers for Youth and Family Street Workers Unit, and on and on. We're very, very fortunate to have a, a close group of partners we interact with on a daily basis. We could not do our job without their support. Moving on to the bottom of this slide, at the last, um, uh, I shouldn't say the last, but at the City Council overview hearing, uh, we were asked to provide a standard for school safety. This is a draft that we're continuing to work on. This was very good feedback that we heard that we're trying to put into motion as quickly as possible. And as you can see here, we're drafting a standard for school safety where all of the following school features and pro protocols are fully operational and consistently performed. Uh, and I say, um, uh, school features and protocols because they're two different things. From one standpoint, we need to make sure that infrastructure uh, is in place, that facilities features are in place, like locking classroom doors, locking exterior doors, card access readers, so on and so forth. Uh, but from a protocol standpoint, from a practices standpoint, we also need to make sure that those things, which are much more driven by the human element in schools, that those are performed consistently and routinely as well. Those being controlling who's in your building and who's not, understanding who your visitors are, for example, uh, understanding the importance of your fire drills, your safe mode drills, and going through them the right way uh, year in and year out. Moving on, uh, given that this is a budget hearing, we did want to present uh, a little information on the budget, which of course you have more information from uh, our colleagues in BPS Finance. Uh, as you can see, uh, from year to year, FY18 to FY19, uh, the budget is increasing uh, by nearly 180,000, so roughly a 3.5% budget in uh, the total budget. Uh, as you can see, the personnel budget has increased by nearly 3%. The non-personnel is increasing by closer to 18%. And the number of FTEs is increasing by 2, from 80 to 82. That increase of 2, as noted below the chart, comes from two additional school police officers uh, who we will be assigning to schools of high need uh, effective July 1. So as soon as the fiscal year begins, we plan to deploy those two additional school police officers. Um, in addition to that, uh, I believe this came up at the overview hearing a couple short weeks ago. Uh, due to FCC regulations, law enforcement agencies across the country need to move away from analog radio systems and uh, make sure that all radio systems are on digital 
the digital platform going forward. Uh, in partnership with BPD, we will be making sure that we're doing that with all of our radios across Boston School Police, uh, in addition to any radio units used at schools. Uh, that's uh, uh, going to begin during this next fiscal year uh, through $150,000 investment. Uh, that $150,000 investment, because of the way the financing is, is structured, is, is misleading because it's overall about a $1 million investment uh, in new radio infrastructure for our school police team so that we can continue to work in sync with BPD. Moving on, we're very happy to take some time talking to you tonight about school safety audits. This is some uh, work that goes uh, typically unnoticed, but it's incredibly important uh, to the work of the district to continue to maintain safe environments for our uh, students, staff, and families. First, we conducted comprehensive audits of our school facilities, uh, which revealed the following statistics, and we touched on this a couple weeks ago at our uh, overview hearing. We found from that work that 100% of our school buildings have fully functioning exterior doors. 93% have locking classroom doors. 100% will have a card access readers by June, and I'll make a, another note on that in a second. And 95% have operational intercom systems. Is this where we want to be? No, it's not where we want to be. We would like all of these things to be 100%. In addition to that, when we talk about classroom doors, we do also have to understand that there are roughly 10,000 uh, classroom doors across the school district, and week in and week out, we do get requests to repair. Uh, classroom doors or repair classroom door locks or to replace keys, that's something that happens on an ongoing basis throughout the year. Uh, what this 95, 93% represents uh, is the percentage of uh, school classroom door locks across the district that have functioning uh, hardware uh, or that have hardware in place as part of a master key system that we know need to shore up with some more work, which we'll get to in a little while. Uh, the other note that I wanted to mention on card access, because this came up two weeks ago, is we have nine schools left in our implementation of the card access reader uh, program, the uh, card reader access program uh, that we've unveiled over the last few years. So by the beginning of June, we will be done with that process. All schools across the district will have card reader access. That's when we will have 100%. I can share with you those nine schools if need be. With that, I'll pass it off to Kim, as she and Rick in particular lead up the school safety audit work with school leaders. Thanks, John. Um, so as John mentioned, um, safety services, myself, the executive director position, and the director of safety services conduct approximately 50 internal audits per year. Um, just to give you an example of some of the factors, we consider multiple factors, but some of the highlights are school access. Um, within the school access, we review the superintendent's circular that help schools plan for this, but also items such as the buzzer camera, how do you inquire, threshold increase with visitors, visitor sign-in, um, how do they access the rest of the building, um, and um, making sure that we're editing that circular um, for the next school year to enhance um, threshold inquiries by schools, for instance. No access without proper identification or at least confirmation of identification. And these are things that should take place before the doors open, not after the doors open. We don't have any secure vestibules at BPS, so there's some other things that we need to put into place. And we have these conversations during, during the internal audit meetings with all the leadership and safety teams that are present at those meetings. Um, additionally, we review um, our Crisis Go app. Um, so Crisis Go is, a, is an online smartphone app that we use um, for central office to um, alert, communicate, and deploy around incidents that happen and occur across the spectrum that demand response or support from central office. In addition to that, there's a portion of the Crisis Go app that schools will be able to alert the building that they're in and control their, control their messaging to staff. So this is part of the platform that we plan on tapping into this spring and through next school year. Um, so we're gonna pilot approximately six schools. So to give you an example, we use it for bowling, bowling alerts. We had an incident in the bowling building um, that forced us to really look at kind of how do we communicate. It's a big building, it's an open building. We have you know, upwards of 300 staff there. Um, and so essentially what it allows you to do as a manager, and we have multiple managers of the app, to alert if there's a neighborhood advisory. So there's a car accident in Dudley that um, causes a huge emergency response and people are obviously wondering what that's about. I'm able, or the manager is able to communicate with BPD, oh, there was an accident, someone was bumped, there was, no, there was no serious injuries, but they were bumped by a bus, it's creating an emergency response right outside the windows. 
um, we're able to send that message out quickly, give a quick explanation, and everybody knows what's going on. That same, can, that can be repeated within school buildings for the same type of thing. Um, you know, incidents that are most common, potentially a neighborhood advisory, an evacuation drill, and if need be, a safe mode drill, or directions around an internal threat if there was one that, that came upon them in the school. Um, additionally, we'll review uh, mandatory drills in the next slide. Um, fire drills, safe mode, and internal threat. Talk to them not only about meeting those mandates, but supporting them around conducting those drills within their buildings. So fire drills, as you can see, are, are mandated um, four times a year, and safe mode drills in September and January. Um, so to date, those are our compliance percentages. 94% of the schools have completed two or in full compliance and fire drills, and 6% of the schools have completed one and have either scheduled another drill or are working to schedule one. Um, I think it's important to note around the safe mode and internal threat drill, we've done a lot of work uh, last year, last April, we fully edited the circular to be parallel with Boston Police Department, who we work hand in hand with every day. So um, Sergeant Sexton's the commander of the school unit that's dedicated to supporting us. Um, he has officers assigned to regions with, throughout the di school district. Um, and so we align that circular with best practices and how BPD is also gonna respond. Um, so um, safe mode is for exterior threats and the internal threat is, is self-explanatory, but it walks you through those drill procedures. Um, so we wanted to align that so that we were losing, using common language and that schools weren't complicating a situation that should be simplified for them. There was a lot of cross language, such as containment, shelter in place, or a lot of people using different terms, and we wanted to iron it down and make it simple for presentation to staff and professional development. So the best practice language that we use is run, hide, fight, and safe mode based on what our partners at BPD use and how they're gonna respond to such an occasion. So one of the initiatives um, that we launched in January but started meeting about and was introduced to um, Boston Public Schools um, through Chief Dorsey and uh, Makiba McCreary and Dan Mulhern at the Mayor's Office of Public Safety um, was the Sandy Hook Promise. Um, if folks aren't familiar, this is a group of uh, 20, approximately 20 parents who um, got together after the horrible tragedy in Newtown and said, what can we do differently? Um, what, what hasn't worked in the past for communities or groups of people that had suffered such a tragedy? And so they did a lot, they did an enormous research-based effort to figure out what that would be. And what they came up with um, was this iteration of Sandy Hook Promise based on the concepts of inclusivity and knowing the signs to prevent the next violent act. So instead of the strict focus on lobbying for gun violence and things like that, they decided to focus on prevention. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate to have them in the district. So we moved fairly quickly by BPS standards and government standards to get this moving. Um, it's imp also important to note it comes to no cost to the district. So as of January of 2018, we had a formal launch. Um, and we have a full-time coordinator for the next three to five years paid for by Sandy Hook Promise that sits with our behavioral health team um, and kind of has a dual supervision. Myself and Senior Director of Behavioral Health, Andrea Amador, um, help to support Joe Cronin and his access to the district um, to, to what we're hoping is all components of Sandy Hook Promise over the next three to five years throughout the district. Um, so just some year one updates. Um, the development of a steering committee, that steering committee includes a director of guidance, um, executive director and director of safety, um, the executive director of cell, uh, social emotional wellness, uh, senior director of behavioral health, one operational superintendent, senior director of safe and welcoming schools, and succeed Boston. Um, and we hope to broaden that as necessary. Um, it would be great to ultimately have, I think, a youth voice in that group as we move forward and school leaders or someone from some operational teams, and they have a lot on their plate, so as we plan and move to implementation of some of the programming, we'll work to expand that committee as necessary or create subcommittees. Um, so we've had nine schools um, launch Start With Hello this year, which is essentially from gra for grades two to 12, and it's about inclusivity. It's about creating this umbrella where all, nobody is isolated. Um, and young people are empowered to talk to trusted adults and encouraged to be, make sure that none of their peers are isolated, where they're eating, playing, sitting, um, to just incorporate that, 
that atmosphere within the school and for longevity. So this gets accomplished by Sandy Hook Promise presenters. So they have 75 regional presenters trained that we have access to. And so we have two, two to four that we count on in this district that can either that can go in to present. There's also a, um, a train the trainer model where they can go in and give them the, the information to the assigned teacher and they can help perpetuate the curriculum. Um, but the launches were really exciting. A couple of the schools we did, Linden, Madison Park, the Mason School. So they all went over very well and the response has been, has been great. Next year we're looking to, um, we're planning now for more schools for Start With Hello and then we'll move to other programming components include, including knowing the signs. Um, so this is for ages six to 12. Um, to recognize young people that might be isolated or depressed or having some other issues and being able to report that to a trusted adult. Um, and then there is the safety assessment um, piece where the safety assessment and intervention. So currently um, all of the school psychologists have already been trained in that. Um, they already had some previous components, so this is building on that component, but that will allow then school psychologists to go in and train smaller teams within the school. So that's a true train the trainer model for efficiency and sustainability. Um, and then action planning for school year 18, 19. Um, we're excited to be looking forward to the um, knowing the signs SARS anonymous reporting system. So say something anonymous reporting system. This will come to us in the form of a smartphone app, a phone number, or a website. And this is really gonna allow um, young people, students, staff to be empowered to report anonymously um, anything of concern to them. So while we know young people and students are already reporting and already have trusted relationships, this is really gonna empower that group that doesn't want that stigma or is afraid to say something. So we're very excited about that. Um, and we'll have um, six pilot schools in the fall. So additionally, uh, Safety Services Department has great partnerships internally, particularly with Student Support Services, Sell Well, and specifically Behavioral Health. Um, so while we work together to manage along with BPD um, and our operational superintendent staffs, all incidents that take place in circumstances where schools need support, um, we also have um, threat assessment protocols in place, again, in collaboration with BPD. Um, all central office staff, principals, nurses, and school psychologists have been trained in threat assessment. And as I already said, through the partnership with Sandy Hook Promise, that'll be enhanced. Uh, emergency management, um, BPS has a long-standing emergency management training facilitated by staff, and we stay updated on best practices. So we will be looking, particularly as we move into the next school year, to continue that and to work with central office and executive cabinet about a mandate around emergency planning. But for, for now, annually, every school is required to submit an emergency plan or a safety plan. Um, we are also gonna ask next year that they identify each staff person by name uh, so that we have a very strong understanding and record of the threat assessment team. It's supposed to be a multidisciplinary team. We wanna ensure that we're supporting that and have that down. And their safety team within every school building. Um, so that allows us, as we go through internal audits, to be meeting with the correct people, talking to them about that plan. As you know, every building is different um, and every staff is different and populations of young people are different. They present different challenges. So we, you know, that's the importance of those internal audit meetings to have those intimate conversations with school leaders and their teams. Um, additionally, just around the school, the partnerships that John mentioned, um, BPD, uh, we also have, um, BPD is a daily partnership, um, and they're very, that unit in itself is, is prevention and intervention oriented. We work hand in hand with them. Um, the Boston Fire Department, Rick Duraney oversees, along with Jody Elgie at Succeed Boston from um, Selwell, a fire sense program. So the purpose of this program, funded by safety services, is to keep young people that um, may start a small fire or have any type of incident like that within a school, we refer them out of, the, to keep, divert them from the court system into a fire sense program where they do a certain amount of hours on a Saturday in an educational student support program where they get any counseling that they need as well. And once they complete that, that will not be followed up by the court, that, would, that they've met their mandate. So the fire department and Rick Duraney work hand in hand with Jody's operation to make sure that we're eliminating that school to prison pipeline for those types of offenses for young people. Um, in addition, we've started a model with the Boston Center for Youth and Families, although Boston Center for Youth and Families Street Worker Program has been a prevalent presence in many schools throughout the years. 
Um, we thought, particularly in collaboration with Dan Mulhern and the Mayor's Office of Public Safety, that it was time to look at formalizing that and being really proactive. So we identified seven high schools and had a meetings with their leadership team about what they need from Boston Center for Youth and Families to help to mitigate incidents in their school and be proactive around identifying resources, resources and making referrals for young people in particular. Um, and we know that it's, you know, it's no secret that some young people, gang affiliated, gang associated, have to deal with those dynamics, have to navigate the violence in the community. Um, and this is a really great way to be proactive, particularly as we move into the spring. So all these meetings happen during the winter and as it warms up and people are more active in the community, we've already been proactive with strategies with some of the high schools where we see the highest level of incident or they just have the biggest group of young people that need the most diverse resources. Um, our active shooter presentations, another item that we cover in the internal audit. Um, but currently, and I'm just going to update this number, we've had one more presentation since we put this data in. We've had 35 presentations completed in this school year um, with some a good 13 pending. Um, these are um, presentations that are facilitated by certified trained Boston police officers. They're designated officers, so we see the same two officers all the time in our district. Um, so the collaboration looks like this. Um, BPD makes a presentation, um, a set presentation to schools on site, which is our preference. So we're dealing with and presenting to a school community that lives with each other every single day in their building. Um, BPD does their presentation and myself, Executive Director, Director Rick Rainey, often Chief Weston, most of the time Chief Weston and um, Sergeant Section from the School Police Unit are present um, to support the dialogue questions and scenarios that come up uh, that school, the school community staff and leaders need feedback on. Uh, so this is again aligned to the run, hide, fight. Uh, this is really, this presentation is about situational awareness, about global awareness um, in the climate that we all live in in the world now. Um, the objective of the presentation is to empower staff in their own space, to know their space, to take the time to look at that space before, an in, before it's an elevated incident and an emergency. Um, so it's really a time for dialogue around how you maneuver in very challenging spaces and how they can prepare during downtime for those things. And also gives them an opportunity to talk to trained professionals about what the BPD response is going to be, what it's gonna look like, what it's gonna feel like, what it's gonna sound like. Um, so we have found um, the vast majority, and we've even had a couple of schools say it's the best professional development they've ever had. Um, so it really is an open dialogue, and Rick and I make ourselves available as the Sergeant Sexton and Chief West, and we will go back and do a walkthrough, do their drills with them. And that concludes the formal presentation. Uh, obviously, we're here to answer whatever questions the council has. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very comprehensive, thorough work here. I want to thank you. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, John, uh, you mentioned the nine schools. Maybe offline, you could provide us that. And and those nine schools should be online by. Did you say June first or it July? It wouldn't be 1st? June. Uh, it likely by the middle of June. Okay, and so as I as I double checked my notes, it's actually eight in one of those buildings is White Stadium. So it's seven schools plus and, White Stadium. Okay. Yeah, you can pro provide that offline. That sure. would be great. Um, obviously, you have a great partnership with BPD, and you were talking about going from analog to digital. Um, how did you, how were you able to communicate with from the analog to the digital, or do you? The radios, I guess, is what I'm asking yeah. about, right? Uh, so about a, about a year and a half ago, this BPD brought this to our attention that they were going to begin to transition and the impact was going to start to um, show in the summer of 2018. Mm -hmm. Hence, um, John worked fast and furious to identify funding with our finance and executive cabinet. Um, so it will be a steady transition. There should not be any interruption in communications mm -hmm. because we've been proactive and BPD has been so vocal about the change. Great. So you guys are all, like on the same frequency. They you can, you know, uh, communicate with them directly with the radio. So they can call emergencies directly on the radio and Boston School Police track their channels during the day. Right. So there is direct communication. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you for this important work and uh, let me now recognize Councilor Lydia Edwards. Thank you um, for coming out again and discussing um, this very important issue. I will say, um, 
for us in East Boston, having had a recent gun incident, I think our first, but we had a recent series of gun incidents in possession at our high school. There's a certain heightened awareness, and this couldn't be more timely. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the structures that you're setting up, and then to talk a little bit about the high school in and of itself. Um, with regards to the structure, you had mentioned that you have, um, and I thought the goals and the mission of safety, by the way, in the draft, I think it was in the orange section, mm -hmm. um, you had laid out all the different things or goals that you thought that the, we should be aiming towards, and it is still a draft. Mm -hmm. Who was at the table to help you draft that, and is it going to be circulated to allow for more community feedback? It's certainly good feedback. As I mentioned before, it was good feedback uh, when you brought it to us a couple weeks ago. Um, we tried to set to work on it right away, but clearly for things like this, we want to be able to share it more broadly. So, mm -hmm. you know, taking a cue from what you're mentioning here, we'll, we'll have to consider exactly what that next step is. Uh, what, what What's represented here is the work of the internal team between okay. safety services, behavior, behavioral health, cell well, and facilities. Uh, but we do need to start broadcasting that and better understanding both from external research, mm -hmm. not just in our community, but external research, but also within the community, how do we refine that and make it something that people expect every time they drop their kid off at school. And so when you when this is completed, will there be a timeline added to it to make sure all the, the schools are getting up to this compliance or to these goals? Yeah, and in fact, um, I know you didn't in, intend it that way. It wouldn't be so sequential. We, we want to begin that work now. Yeah. And in fact, that is Excellent. work that we have been doing for years that we'll continue to do. We're very fortunate in that Mayor Walsh doubled the number in our right. capital budget for school safety upgrades from 2.5 million to 5 million. Uh, we're already working hard to think through how are we going to build that contract right now mm -hmm. uh, to go out immediately and start shoring up our buildings. Uh, we do believe, in, in fact, we know that we're in very good place with our exterior doors. Mm -hmm. We do know that there's still some concerns about our classroom doors. We want to make sure that we get that shored up as quickly as possible and then make sure at the same time that our intercom systems across schools are, are fully operational as they are in most cases. So um, your, your budget notes that you're going to have two additional officers, where are they going to go? So those were officers that were um, asked for through the maintenance budget, not the operational budget. And so there's a couple of scenarios that we asked for. Um, if you may be already aware, so the uh, Dearborn is moving out of the Burke to the Dearborn stem right up in uh, Dudley, up behind BDEA, um, and they're doubling the amount of students there. So it was originally identified um, for two officers to be there, so that's one additional officer. And we look for a replacement officer that can get back into the school assignment, um, given that we obligated a full-time officer to the bowling building, because we have wide open transportation and welcoming center on the second floor, and that's their primary area of concern. Do you have any um, plans to work with the PTAs and with parents to either have them be volunteers in schools that are part of the safety team, um, I ask that only because in East Boston, we have a very active uh, parental community. Many of the immigrant parents who speak the languages also would would be available. And I think it, it's a resource that we shouldn't overlook. And can, two officers, I, I think, is a, is a step in the right direction, but certainly not enough. So how how can we get um, community involved in safety, or do you, do you plan to? Yeah, I, I think that's an ongoing conversation. Um, mm -hmm. We've certainly spent a lot of time with um, the headmaster there. Um, throughout the year, not just in a reactive way, but in a proactive way. Um, he's got you know, 1,400 students there. Yep. It's a lot to handle. Um, he's got some capacity issues managing that. Mm -hmm. And so with the operational superintendent and the safety team, um, we'll, we'll look at all options to complement what Phil has there around safety. Um, that's certainly something we can look at. I have, haven't looked at it in the past. I think some people have. Um, so we can look at the challenges and the, and the, the, the possible um, pros of having that option. For sure. And just two, two, two more questions. One is about language and the capacity for the apps and all of the language tool or the communication tools, which I think are excellent, by the mm -hmm. way, uh, yeah. that you've come up with a way for, you, for young people to report, to be able to speak uh, anonymously, but also for you to even communicate amongst yourselves in an app. Um, but just, just tell me in terms of the language capacity and how that's going to be built out. Yeah, that's something I can get some more information from you. I can tell you that there's a 24-hour crisis center staffed by 75 quali um, qualified um, 
crisis counselors with language capacity. Mm -hmm. It's not in this state, but it's a vendor through Sandy Hook Promise. Mm -hmm. So that's where the initial reports get processed, vetted for safety, non-life safety, and then they get sent to our established chain of communication. So we're always sensitive to being um, culturally competent around language. We'll work with our communications department in Sandy Hook Promise. They've done it all over the country, mm -hmm. so uh, including Miami, LA, and Colorado. So I'm, I'm confident that they've tackled that issue and that we'll be able to accommodate. One of the other suggestions that came up in a recent parent meeting was either eliminating backpacks or using clear backpacks as a way to assure that there's safety in the schools. I didn't know if there was any movement on that or thoughts about that. One of the biggest issues we have in East Boston High School is that if we do, do have everyone go through the metal detectors, we're talking about folks being late to class, 30 to 40 minutes, so it cuts into our education time. So balancing efficiency and safety is, you know, it's extremely hard and I appreciate the efforts already, yeah. but I just want your thoughts about backpacks. Yeah, we haven't dug into that option yet. I think what, you know, one of the things we want to do is maintain those self and self safe and welcoming environments mm -hmm. and not infringe too much on the young people and the students and the families. Um, like I said, we understand the capacity issues at East Boston High School. Um, there are other schools that have talked about the same type of issues. I think there's some other avenues that we can look at. Mm -hmm. um, but there's certainly nothing off the table. Um, but I, we don't want to we won't. We don't want to force that kind of conforming in that sense. I think that. I think that would be challenging. The I'm not saying it's not practical in some ways for obvious reasons. The clear backpacks. Correct. Okay. Um, but we'll be we'll be working closely with Phil as we move into the next school year. I know that his um, teaching staff has been wonderful and committed yeah. to an extensive support yeah. um, until the end of June. But that's not going to be something that he can maintain. All right. Well, thank you. You bet. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, lady and gentlemen. Um, part of my job is to ask the tough questions, and, and as John well knows, at these budget hearings, I will uh, point out issues of disagreement. Uh, this is one where there is no disagreement. In fact, <laughs> however much money you're asking for, I think we should meet and surpass that. Uh, well, wait a second, then. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciated your comments, John, and, and I agree with you completely. Um, and I know, as a dad, I know that this this is you know personal for you on a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. And my God, every time we see what we saw in Parkland, uh, Florida, a couple months ago now, it's just it's all of our biggest fear. Right. And it is um, it's sad that this is the life that we live in. I. I don't want to go too much on a tangent, but Columbine happened when I was in college. So, you know, I'm old enough or young enough to never even conceive that there would be danger in a school. Um, and unfortunately, that is not the way to live. And so right off the bat, I know the answer, which is why I'm asking this question. Can we all agree that a sort of back off the cuff comment from the president of the United States that we should arm teachers is a uh, ridiculously flawed and terrible idea. Is that the statement of Boston Public Schools as well? Okay. Yes. That was a very bad idea. Good. Thank you for that. Um, very I'm briefly. Married to a teacher, and believe me, it's a very bad idea. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, briefly, personnel. So personnel is up $135,000, which would pay for two additional officers. Correct. Non personnel is up $40,000. And is that for the radio upgrade? Um, there's $150,000, which is a new line yeah, um, okay. for radio needs. Um, but I can look at specifically what that, and we took out um, several dollars from the contract services, so I can confirm that. More curious you. than yeah. anything else. We yeah. can talk about yeah. that later. Yep. The deputy chief position is vacant uh, on your org chart? It is. It is, is currently it posted? posted. It has been posted internally and externally, yes. And will, can we uh, get a commitment that it will be filled by the new school year? Yes. Great. Oh, yes. Great. Um, I noticed on the last two pages, which shows um, the budgets of this year and last year, that several positions look like they have uh, decreased in salaries. Is that true, or is that a typo? Specifically, the first two positions listed um, look at about an $11,000 pay cut each. Maybe that maybe some there was some formatting error or something when this was prepared. 
I, I don't know. It could be in the yeah. way that the school district does budgeting. If you might, you might recall, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but the way that the school district does budgeting for salaries, it's based on the average within the tier of that position. So the budgeted number for a given position in the school district might change year over year, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that person's salary is changing. It's a little bit complicated. I don't even fully understand it myself, but that yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up okay. from finance. From finance. So, okay. Uh, essentially, the way that they do it is they take the average within the tier for every position in the school district, um, and then that average might change year over year as averages change. Okay. Here comes your trustee yeah. colleague. Hey, this is kind of minor. I guess just we can talk later. I don't want to eat into my five minutes, but I was going to advocate for you. I was worried that you took a eleven thousand dollar haircut. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate that. that. Yeah, it's comfortable. If that's how you found out. Yeah. Yeah, that would be <laughs> awful. I get. If she's offering, we'll take it. But otherwise, we're good. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Um, talk a little bit about the protocols for because this came up a lot. There was, we have all had incidents, and I don't need to specify them. But someone rings a bell. Um, is there, how many schools have cameras as opposed to just an intercom system ballpark? Most, I assume, just have the intercom system. Some have cameras. Uh, cameras at the front door? Yeah. We believe, I believe every school has a camera at the front, front door. Typically, mm -hmm. it's one of those small units. That's and are they all working? The are they? They're I mean, working and we're working to get monitors for a better picture okay. for some of them. So we're going to be looking yeah, at that. Yeah, any upgrade we, we can do, we should invest right. in and we will stand to make sure we can. You know, you guys can afford that. So someone, a, a, a non-parent or an individual, an adult, rings the bell and then is there training in place for the, you know, school secretaries, for folks that work as admin assistants at the front office? Does ever, is there a regimented policy on how that person, are they... In other words, does someone come from the office to greet them at the front door? Are they buzzed in and told to come up to the office to sign in? Does it vary school by school? There is a policy, SAF 07, that dictates school access. Yeah. It's, we're going to tweak some of it to make sure that we're identifying before we're buzzing into the school, as opposed to the trusted practice of, oh, that's so-and-so's mom, I'm going to buzz them in, I'm going to come to the front door. Good. I think um, that's because crucial. Because if you've got a consistent person covering and they're on the ball, that's great. If you have a substitute that day, it presents with problems. So there's some things that we want to tweak based on things that have happened in real, real time, you know, in, in scenarios over the past couple of years that we want folks to be sensitive to because it's not always the person that you don't know, of right? Course. There's a lot, much less likelihood that we're going to have that type of situation of extreme and much more likely that it'll be domestic violence or a custody issue or someone known to the school that's having some issues. Good. No, I'm glad to hear that. And then 70, there will be 77 school officers in this budget. Should this budget pass? 77 school officers. And how many schools are there? 120? 125. 125. Um, what would it cost to get an additional 50 Officers and has that been a discussion to have a dedicated school police officer at every school? So we've made internal recommendations for at least another 32 officers, which would be approximately 1.7 million dollars to cover all high schools and middle schools and K through eights. It would be additional 48 officers to cover all elementary schools that don't currently have an officer. So it will be an ongoing discussion, and in lieu of a full officer, I think there's a, a intelligent discussion starting to happen about. Um, what parasecurity looks like. Um, what do community field coordinators look like with those responsibilities? And so while we haven't had full out discussions about that, given the climate and given this session, um, I think we're primed to start having those conversations. They may be more manageable. We also want to think about this climate, right? We know that the best public safety strategy is to put people in place who create rapport and communicate Absolutely. with students, families, and staff, and are able to conduct conflict resolution, de-escalate young people, identify signs before they happen. Um, so I think we're exploring those options Good. and have made internal recommendations to help support that. Good. And just one thing I would yep. note, Councillor, if you, if you don't mind. It, what we also have to do when, when looking at those um, recommendations is to make sure that we're also balancing the concerns that some people have that we're creating too much of a police presence in our schools uh, and how do we balance those two because we hear different people saying very strongly you should do this, and other people saying you should you should not do that. You should do this. So do it's just something that has to be part of a longer fair community fair conversation. Fair point. I agree 100 percent. Do school police officers carry firearms? No. Um, and then, and that is a very good point. I remember visiting one school in my district early on, and there were metal detectors, and it 
it just didn't fail right. And I said to the principal, we should get rid of those. And he said, we want them and the students want them. And it was sort of, mm. you know, a moment I hadn't thought of. Yeah. Um, I mean, and we also say that those, those are a tool. They're not an end-all be-all. No. It's just another tool right. for you to use. No, absolutely. Well, I'll wait for the next round. Did want to point out the great work Rick Duraney does every day. And he's been a great resource to my office as well. So thank you uh, to your entire team. Without a doubt. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Savi George. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for being here and doing this presentation. I know it's something new, uh, but very important. I will say that as a former high school teacher at East Boston High, the, the two most important and useful and fulfilling hours of professional development I had ever had in my 13-year career uh, was the active shooter training um, that I participated in just before I actually took my leave uh, and won this seat. I will also say as a parent of four kids, three of them in the Boston Public Schools, that um, every one of these incidences that we have nationwide, I use as an opportunity to talk to my kids. And one of my boys, uh, he just turned 12, but his um, response to me was, and this is, these are the things that we internalize um, as parents and as teachers, he said, well, mama, there's a, you know, there's a coat room right next to the front door. So if something happens in my building, if I hide in that closet, when someone comes in, I can tackle them. And that's, you know, that's not what we want our kids thinking about when they go to school every day. We want them to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that it's something that the school safety is something that I think about um, and have thought about since my first day teaching in the classroom. So I think that it's, um, it's important that you're here and it's important that we as a city support the work that you're doing to make sure that our schools are safe and have not just the preventative stuff uh, in place, but the things that we need in, in case there is something to happen, hopefully we, it's a waste of money, that we never have to use any of it. Um, I will say I am disappointed that we haven't done the active shooter presentations as part of our professional development in all of our schools. And I would say for me, it's a really important goal. I was very surprised to see it's only been done in 35 well, schools. I can clarify that it's been happening for the last three years and started by the Emer uh, Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. Um, so it has happened in more schools. This is just this school year's number. Our goal oh, is to do okay. them every two years. Okay. Um, so given... So has every school had the training at least once? So I, we'd have to go back. We didn't track it either until last school year formally. Um, but I could say with confidence that the majority have had them in one form or another, but this is the updated version, hence the every two years. Okay. But right. we just met with the B BPD Academy yesterday and talked about kind of some capacity issues around that and how we can be make it more of a routine and perhaps hit a higher number every school year. So we're sensitive to that. Great, one and I'll um, make sure to save that question as well for uh, Boston Police Department when we have the commissioner and his team before us. And yeah. A few weeks I mean, the other thing we would like to do is talk to, we're talking to the superintendent about mandating the active shooter presentation as a part of professional development. So you know as a teacher, you, have my you don't, support on that you don't get on that schedule, and you, uh, no. but, they, but teachers and school leaders have been very responsive, but I don't want it to be reactive. I want mm -hmm. it to be an automatic mandate every other year for them instead of, oh, there's an incident, I haven't had this, yep. let me do it. Yep. John, I cut you off, I'm sorry. No, sorry. just one note, and this is, not to, not to say anything less about the partnership with BPD, but one of the struggles we have that prevents us from doing more is the scheduling with BPD to make sure that we can get out to these schools. It's such a sensitive topic and we have to get it right that we're just not there yet with a train the trainer type of approach. We really rely on the support of BPD with their, with their small number of, of trained facilitators in the space who are FBI certified. Um, we may look at expanding that model or eventually doing a train the trainer to allow us to, to more broadly uh, cast a net across the school district. Right now, that's one of the challenges that we have. Yeah, I think one of the benefits of having it be the Boston Police officers doing the training is that they are the first responders. One of the things I will say is concerning though is we will have that presentation. I know that various, and this is more of a conversation with Boston Police, but certainly in relationship with BPS, is that it, the SWAT team and some of the specialized units within Boston Police and the school police unit uh, within Boston Police has been trained in um, responding to an active shooter incident, but the local, police district, the first responders, you know, the guy that's 
might be sitting outside just by chance or is just up the street or the EMT that's stationed to that particular area or Boston Fire that's in that area, they're going to be the first responders, not the specialized unit. Mm -hmm. So as much as we can get that, those individuals into our school buildings to do yeah. walkthroughs and have an awareness of some of these very oddly built buildings, I think is really important. Yeah, I would agree, yeah. Um, and I also think when we talk about training, that's not me. No. <laughs> All right. I'm looking at his w. clock over here. Um, the, as it relates to training, that we are also training subs uh, because they are not trained in, in safe mode or any of these drills. They're not trained, quite honestly, in fire drills and which staircase is appropriate for whatever classroom they happen to be in, mm -hmm. but that also any of our outside partners that happen to be working in our schools, that they're also aware of the appropriate drill um, or the appropriate response should there be a fire drill, an active shooter drill, or unfortunate mm -hmm. incident, mm -hmm. um, or a lockdown safe mode mm -hmm. incident, that they know what the appropriate response is within that building. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna... I just want to say one more thing yeah. to Ms. Sure. Asabi George. Um, I know that you were interested in attending an internal audit, so whenever it suits your fancy, we'd love to have you, Rick Durani and I, to come to a That'd school or more Thank than you. one. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you. Uh, and we've been joined by Councillor Ed Flynn. Chair recognizes Councillor Zakem. Uh, Mr. Chairman, good evening. Um, quickly, just want to talk about the, uh, the Snowden School, um, which is in my district. and. Uh, unfortunately, as this is an issue I bring up at other BPS hearings, it's one of the only Boston public schools uh, in District 8, but that's, that's for another day. Um, there have been some issues with Snowden, obviously, you know, on Newberry Street, very close to Copley Square, has had, I think, a lot of issues, um, often after hours, um, maybe not when students are there, of uh, loitering, uh, drug use, um, that sort of activity in some of the uh, doorways, windows, alcoves, that sort of thing, and I'm just wondering what your awareness is of that situation, if there are plans to address it, and maybe what either, whether it's school police or private contracted security does after hours at, a, at BPS facilities. Um, we can certainly, we, we address those types of issues all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we work with the district and our liaison at BPD. We've also worked with Homeless Services and the Boston Public Health Commission on issues of needles and um, folks in and around areas where there's school children, school age kids. Um, so normally how it works is that there'll be issues that are brought up either by the custodian to facilities or from the school leader to the operational superintendent. They'll come to safety services and we'll branch out from there. So I'm, I'd be happy to address that issue, talk to the school leader, and, and, and take what, a look at it. What's typically the capacity after hours? So after you know, school's dismissed, uh, you know, a couple hours, everyone's out of the building. Um, I mean, primarily, we'd work with the Boston Police Department and the captain in that district mm -hmm. to make it more of a routine for the district and, and yeah. see what their feedback is. And they're usually very responsive. Right. I, I just, I, I flag it because, well, one, I, I walk by it all the time, and I, it's, you know, I, I see it myself. Um, you know, it's right near the Copley T stop. It's across from a 7-Eleven, which has its own problems uh, on this front. Um, but, you know, aside from just the loitering, I think, you know, it does create a dangerous situation, uh, certainly early in the morning, I think, when students are arriving, um, and even in the afternoon. So to, to put that on, on your agenda to the extent, and I know um, uh, D4 police have been, you know, responsive, but obviously that's usually, you know, calls are important and if school staff are calling them or if there is um, some sort of after hours uh, capacity to do it. And we're having the same discussions with uh, the library and their hearing, you know, mm -hmm. about their, about the central branch, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not, it's certainly not unique to that neighborhood, um, but it has been a, a growing concern, a growing concern for the school community, uh, I think just as much as uh, people in the neighborhood. So um, what we can do to address that uh, would be very helpful and making sure that the school team uh, and school leadership there has has all the support they can get. Um, but that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, Thank for your attention. Thank you. Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Siomo. I had a couple questions. Um, one, first question on the Condon School in South Boston. I know there was a shots fired incident maybe a year and a half ago um, in the public housing development nearby. Um, I believe the students were still in the playground at the time. Um, what lessons were learned from that incident? So we, I was on the call with you, Councillor, how are you, around the Condon recently. Um, so what we 
when we work with school leaders, when we meet with them on audits, um, you know, that has been an area where there's been several incidents over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, we work really closely with the district and BPD, but we also work with Robbie Chisholm, who's the principal over there, and his staff, um, including the partnership with BCYF, uh, to ensure that if there is any communication whatsoever, um, looks wrong, sounds wrong, feels wrong, you're going back in the building. Um, and working on those um, specific drills for safe mode when you need to get kids back inside. Um, even if you're not sure if that's what you heard, if you think it's a problem, getting them back in. Um, you know, and when those things take place, we are in consistent communication with the Boston Police Department about is there an ongoing conflict? Is it something that's happened repeatedly week to week, night to night? Um, do they need to stay in for recess for the rest of the week? Um, do we need to have a larger presence during arrival dismissal from BPD and Boston School Police? So all those factors will get considered. One thing I would add there, Councillor, if you wouldn't mind, is that one of the other complexities that we deal with in many of our school buildings related to safety is that we're not always the only occupant in the building. So specifically at the Condon, at the Quincy Elementary, which we discussed recently, mm -hmm. uh, we have the issue of having to make sure that we're working in close uh, conjunction with BCYF, and in some cases we're working with health centers, uh, because we might be trying to enact our protocols to the fullest degree, but if they're not adhering to those same uh, strategies or practices, it sort of sets us up to have an unsafe situation. So we're constantly trying to work closely with our partners in BCYF and other sectors uh, so that we can all be on the same page. No, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, as it relates to the Quincy School, I know your staff has been very helpful in trying to um, provide some assistance as it relates to the, the playground area mm -hmm. of the Quincy. It's, it's, it's wide open, as you know, and I just would love to have some type of um, more um, detailed security plan in there. It's too inviting for people coming off the street to access the playground, especially when kids are there during, during playtime. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a concern. I, I hope long term or short term we could come up with a plan to uh, deal with that situation yes it's certainly on our radar okay does every does every school is every school you, you may have talked about it earlier but is every school certified in terms of a evacuation plan a safety plan what are the protocols is every school certified by the the school or the school department in the in the Boston Police. So every school is mandated by DESE, the Department of um, Elementary and Secondary Education, to have a safety emergency plan in place for every school year, and so it's reviewed by Rick Durrani, by our safety services in our office, and submitted by the school leader and their safety team. So every person in that school knows exactly what they need to do at at what specific time during an evacuation. Yeah, that's what. That's yep, they run four drills a year. Correct. That's the expectation. Yep. As, as Kim mentioned, this is something that's expected every school year. So before we uh, activate school buildings, if you will, at the beginning of every school year, there are certain things that we have to check off uh, with our school leaders um, so that we have confidence that the school is going to operate as well as we expect it to. One of those is their school safety plan that has to be in place before the school year begins. Is every, every door in the school department, in the schools, um, certified is it up to par up to standards in terms of the locking procedure unlocking procedure is there any concerns that you have about any of the doors we have roughly 10,000 different classroom doors in the school district, so we do have some concerns. We're not at 100% security with our classroom doors. We want to be. We think that the capital plan investment, particularly the increase uh, from Mayor Walsh in that line item, will go a long way toward getting us to that goal. Uh, from an exterior door perspective, those are always, for obvious reasons, our most important priorities. Uh, we're happy to say, but we're not patting ourselves on the back, that 100% of our exterior doors around the district are operating functionally, um, they're fully operational, uh, however you want to characterize it. Uh, that said, we're trying to stay ahead of those as well to make sure that we're repairing exterior doors at the slightest sign that they need to be repaired or replaced. 
Um, that's something that we send a team out right away when we get a request uh, to repair. As far as the classroom doors go, uh, as mentioned in the slides here, we found that 93% of our classroom doors around the district are part of, a, of an overall kind of functioning locking uh, system within a school. Uh, that does not mean, though, that some of these 10,000 doors don't need to be repaired uh, or that the locks don't need to be repaired or that the keys that have gone missing don't need to be replaced. These are all things that we have to consider as we really try to shore this up. Do you have enough money? Is there enough money in the budget to deal with the situation of, of doors? Um, we believe so. Uh, this is a $5 million investment. Uh, we believe that this is going to be enough to get us through uh, to make sure that we're shoring up those systems as much as we can. And do you have enough um, school police? I think we could use more. Um, that's something we'll discuss about um, making a proposal about how many more and what that would look like. Um, I think it would be ideal to have some sort of um, designated parasecurity or school police officer for several reasons within the school, um, within each school. And um, how, how many school um, police officers are there in the city? So there are, there are 75 currently. There'll be 77 next year. Okay. And with the diverse population of Boston, do you have a breakdown in terms of, you know, how many speak languages other than English as well? Yeah, we could certainly provide that. The reason I was asking, say, like a school like Josiah Quincy, um, would, would a police officer speak Cantonese and Mandarin? Um, um, I don't know if we have anyone that's probably not, but... Um, you know, we're, we're sensitive to that. Um, as we have an opportunity to hire, it's certainly something we consider. Yeah, I think I think that'd be important to at least bring one Cantonese or Mandarin speaking police officer on the staff so that they could interact effectively with um, the children. Um, is there anything that the city council could do to help you on any of these issues? Well, I think as we consider an internal proposal for increased staffing, we could always use the support. Thank on, you. on the note that you raised a second ago about uh, the um, uh, linguistic abilities of our school police officers, uh, one note that Kim had mentioned before that's extremely important to underscore is that we, we really made it even more concerted effort this year to make sure that our school police officers are really feeling like they're part of the culture, the fabric of the school. So certainly looking at dynamics like language access uh, is very important to us so that they can be part of that community. They're not just a police presence. They're really meant to be a support to the students and staff to provide that safe environment. And safety doesn't just come with the police presence. It comes with building rapport, as Kim mentioned before. No, I, I agree. I think it would go a long way to have at least one Cantonese-speaking officer that would be able to effectively communicate with the, the students at the Josiah Quincy School or other schools in the, in the area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the comments and agree with them about the importance of increasing your staffing level, which I absolutely support. Thank my good colleague for bringing up the fact, and I know it's a, it's a, a focus of you all as well, to make sure there's cultural competency and diversity among the staff. And moreover, not increasing the number of uh, school police officers is important, but also looking at other mental health professionals, clinicians to that extent. Um, I mean, I think that we should be, in this year's budget, looking to even bolster those numbers by more than two additional, so I'll certainly, I will say that right now publicly. John's not used to me saying these nice things at these hearings, so uh, take it while you can. Um, do you ever work with, the? has there been any opportunity to work with the, um, the uh, police cadets? You know, is just another adult or young adult in a uniform to sort of help you know, to my knowledge, I have, I'm not in the schools. Yeah. We, have, we did have a recent field trip from the Blackstone to the academy before they graduated. That was fantastic. Yeah. And role modeling, it was, it was great to get over there and see that. And the kids were so engaged with the officers. There are a lot of folks over there. And great class just graduated. So I think it's something, again, that, that partnership is pretty prolific with BPD. Yeah. They're very proactive in the prevention and intervention. And anything that can mitigate kids feeling isolated or kids feeling 
not informed or not feeling like they don't have opportunities and yeah. for role models, it's something we can certainly consider. And I've been particularly impressed with the level of diversity among the police cadets that I think also reflects in the student population of BPS. So we will continue this, these conversations that we, uh, when we have our BPD meeting. Um, can you talk briefly more about the Sandy Hook promise, and I think you touched upon this in the PowerPoint, but I want to drill down a little deeper, um, is sort of the social media. Sadly, every time we hear of one of these catastrophic events, invariably there's a social media post that, you know, someone wrote that was often pre was a prelude to what happened. Do you, is that part of the Sandy Hook promise to monitor, not necessarily monitor, but teach kids to say something if they see something that's unnerving. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we, we get a heavy response from students already reporting things proactively. Um, and then act, and we're able to act on that with our partnership with BPD through Boston School Police. Yep. Um, but certainly the Say Something Anonymous reporting system, I mean, we know how young people live these days, right? Very different than when I was a kid. There were no phones. I yep. would advocate for that. Uh, but. Um, this, we think, is an avenue um, to really create that voice for young people that you know can't step up and say something or won't automatically step up to be able to do it anonymously. So we're hopeful that that's going to increase reporting and then you know plateau at responsible reporting. Um, there are numbers that tell us that there's going to be a certain amount, based on the population you train, there'll be a certain amount of reports. These are reports that'll be life safety. These are the ones that'll be non-life safety, and these are the ones in life safety that will be ones that you will act on. Um, so that's one mechanism. And how did, so we had a scenario, it wasn't a BPS employee, it was another city employee um, who put something that, that indicated to me that he was going to commit self-harm. So mm -hmm. I happened to know his boss and I called his boss and said, yeah. and his boss made sure that EAP was able to reach out to him and he's doing wonderfully fine. He's doing wonderfully now. Great. Um, how does it work if a teacher or if a student sees something, Walk me through the, what the mechanism is. They they either lodge this sort of anonymous tip, or if if they go to a teacher, what what's the teacher's then responsibility? Teachers are mandated reporters, right. but with something like this, that the the student may be a threat to him or herself or others. So in general, it, or yeah. with that system, in, in general, in general. So yeah. now it can come in many different ways. Um, it might be an email to a teacher. We've had many scenarios around that. Um, we get the information via email from a school leader. I may get it, school safety may get it, uh, the school leader may get it and forward it to human capital, but it all comes to us. When we get it, we review it, we contact Boston Police Department immediately and safety services. Um, we're working with um, the operational superintendent to take a look at, first it's BPD to try to figure out, because it's hard to navigate where the where the social media comes from, or where the post comes yeah. from, depending on the mechanism and platform, right? Um, but we'll do the research with BPD to try to investigate that, and our own OIIT department, so Mark Racine, looking at the background if we have to, on can you, can you access account, can you get this information, was it from an email, was it from a BPS email? Um, and then we will try to isolate the address, um, and then ask for a wellness check. Okay. So we, I've probably done All that. Protocol four to five times throughout the year where police have literally gone and you know kicked down a door on a Sunday at nine really? o'clock for a student. Yeah. So it's because of that proactive communication yeah. and partnerships that exist that we're able to intervene in that way. And so then we, at the same time that's happening, a crisis response team is alerted, Andrea Amador and her staff are ready for response. So it's immediately facilitated and we'll pull the school leader in and tell them, okay, this is the scenario with the young person, we obviously pull in the family. So all of that happens very rapidly. But the first concern is, where is this kid, who is this kid, and do we need to intervene right now? If a student brings a firearm to a school, is he or she, I, and I know there has to be, and, there, and I know that there is uh, important protocols, uh, and I want to make sure the kid gets help, and obviously I want to make sure the kid doesn't hurt himself or anyone else. Is a, is a student automatically expelled from that school, expelled from BPS? Is it pending investigation? Is it? Um, so they don't return to that school. Um, we know we have young people that go into the system, whether that be DYS or another, and we have alternative placements. You know, by law, we have to provide an we have an obligation yeah. to educate. So there's different options, um, and maybe options the, that I are more suitable. Your name, but the Barron Center was when I was growing up. Sure, you can go to the Barron yeah. Center, but there's a, we also have Community Academy and an alternative middle school right. to help support young people in those types of circumstances. Yeah. And then, um, in, in, so I know the Sandy Hook Promise was being taught at the Linden School in West Roxbury. I was delighted to hear that uh, and a number of other schools I think you mentioned. Will it be taught in every school 
you know, over the next couple of years? That's the goal, yes. Okay. Yep. And, and does that, what is the cost to, who, who administers the program? So Sandy Hook, we have a uh, paid for full-time staff person that coordinates in our district for us that is an employee of Sandy Hook Promise that yep. sits with myself and Andrea Amador in behavioral health. Um, and then they have, we have access to multiple regional presenters that can come in and do the presentation of all portions of curriculum. The coordinator has capacity to do presentations as well. And then there are guides and curriculum so that teachers can take over that that piece within their school. So, so there's about some how, different how many hours of professional development would it take for a teacher or a school to be certified? Um, I can get the exact number for you, but it's not a long process. Okay. They provide everything for free, all materials, all curriculum, all training in those materials. So, so what would, to, to make sure that every school had access to these, I, it sounds to me really thoughtful and innovative and holistic, um, a holistic approach or an holistic approach, what, what would it take to get every school? Is it just a schedule where we'd have you know, sort of a pecking order, X, Y, Z, start with high schools, middle schools. Well, I think we, you know, we essentially piloted this school year because we really only had about four and a half months to work with yeah. and do the work um, and to launch it in February for Start With a Hoe. That was their national launch week. Um, but what we'll be doing is the steering committee will be reaching out and working with all school leaders to see how efficiently we can do that. And this so wouldn't really, have to be collectively bargained or anything as- uh, Oh, no, it, it's no. a free, so what, what we talked about initially was this should help mitigate incidents in your school. This should help you be able to do your job more effectively. This should help kids learn. Um, so should help kids feel safe. Exactly. I mean, that, that um, reason enough that we so should make sure everyone does that's it. what it's based on, and that's how we've pitched it to school leaders, and there hasn't really, there hasn't been any pushback. So Great. now we just need to find the space and the time, and, and leaders are signing up and creating that space and time. Great. Well, I think in the summer, things quiet down here a bit. Maybe, I don't want to presume to speak for all my colleagues, but maybe this chamber could be a good resource for you guys to um, have several hundred teachers in. We love that. I'm sure they'll come right in. <laughs> I, I, Counselor, if you would mind too, I wanted to expand just very briefly on something else that Kim mentioned um, in terms of the, um, you know, students uh, showing ideations of self-harm or students um, posting things on social media around bringing firearms to schools. Uh, that's where I just want to highlight two, two features of our, our overall approach here. Number one, the operational superintendent role uh, is very, very critical to the success of the school district. We have four of them. Um, Al Taylor, one of our super operational superintendents is here in the gallery right now. Uh, they serve a vital role when things like that come up because they are oftentimes the first point of contact for the school leaders. A school leader, particularly a new principal who hears something like this at their school, oftentimes they don't know how to handle that. We need to make sure that we walk them through that process. That's where the operational superintendent helps to step in and then bring a lot of the coordination to bear from Kim's shop to Andrea's shop and everybody else. In addition to that, Kim mentioned the Crisis Go app earlier on. One of the features of Crisis Go that we like an awful lot is that it has checklists for different categories of things. So for example, there's a checklist related to a suicide attempt or ideations of suicide. There's a checklist related to firearms. So school leaders experiencing that can go through that checklist on Crisis Go while also using Crisis Go as the communication alert mechanism uh, to make sure that they're casting that net out there that people that need to know that we have an ongoing situation that needs to be addressed. Okay. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Savi George. Thank you. Um, I think that you might have referenced it in your comments earlier, but um, I've read it somewhere that school police officers will dress casually and test the um, security of a, a particular school building and conduct sort of a, an audit, I guess, of, of sorts. Can you talk a little bit about that? I guess you, it was maybe called a control audit. Um, can you talk a little bit about the last time one was conducted and um, what the results were? It hasn't happened in my tenure. I would have to defer to Chief Weston. I don't know if he had some. Can you, I'm yeah. sorry, can you come down? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then while he's coming down, I do yeah. want to ask whether or not you know if um, school security is a part of any accreditation for any of our schools. Do you know if, I don't know if that's a piece of a school getting their accreditation. I'm not aware that it is. It might be. I'm not aware of that. We can look into it for you. Okay. Thank you. Chief Weston. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, in regards to those types of audits, I think it was more, it was the Boston Police School Unit officers that would do it. They were the ones that were, they're in regular clothes anyway. It wasn't my officers because we have to be in uniform in the schools, mm -hmm. as you know. 
So I think they would take, you know, a little period of time where they'd go to a school and see if they could walk into the building, walk around, they might find a door propped open, go in, see if anybody stops them at any point in time. And I think they were finding that they would get into a building and they could walk around for 10, 15 minutes before anybody even said anything to them. So it was more of an informal thing a few years ago with the school unit. It could be something that could be done more routinely uh, to keep the principals and headmasters on board with keeping their buildings secure because you know, many of us have gone to schools and we see doors propped open. And that's not, not good in these, mm -hmm. you know, in these days and times. So I think that would be a great option for us. I will say I've gone on school visits myself and that has happened where I just, I don't know, because I've got that teacher look or something, I just <laughs> can wander through that building. Um, do we have, thank you for that. So, I mean, I think that would be an interesting mm -hmm. piece to do, especially as we um, get up to um, speed and I guess or code or whatever on and what we've identified as our needs um, for security. Following up on Matt's questions uh, regarding sort of the teacher reporting piece, is there any training or information for teachers? You know, teachers understand they're ma mandated reporters on certain certain things, but you know, there's a certain level of common sense, I think, in responding to students or to seeing or hearing something as a teacher or being informed of something. But what are, what are the requirements of a teacher to report? So there's mandates around abuse and neglect, yeah. as, you, as you well know. Um, you know, given the current climate, um, we've certainly highlighted through Boston School Police and the mobile units um, and the operational superintendents and communications with their, their, their region. They have approximately 30 to 35 schools each, um, making sure that when you see something, say something. Um, even when kids are joking about threats, we want to make sure we're taking everyone seriously and really it, it ultimately ends up meeting the need of that student. There's other reasons why they're saying what they're saying. And so we want to provide support services at the same time that really paying attention, is this a real threat, is this credible or not? Um, so to the specific training that's provided by school leaders and mandated through the year, I, I, I can find out um, what we have and what school leaders are mandated to do. And I can work with the operational superintendents to get that information for you. I think that would be helpful yep. to share with just with teachers and then again, yep. other adults who might be in a school building and, or in contact with our kids. Um, back to our PowerPoint. Um, you had listed here the, you know, this, this BPS draft for the standard for school safety with certain features. Is there a timeline on when this um, this, you know, I, I get that we're drafting it, it's a, it's a working document, and that's fine, but when is the time that we say all schools have these features? It's, uh, the reason why I'm pausing here is because it's, um, it's, there's no simple answer to this. In some respects, through the work of the capital plan that we mentioned already, uh, which will really just continue some of the capital improvements that we've already been doing in schools, uh, will go a long way toward getting to 100% um, within the next two years on the facilities features that are in here. Um, again, the reason why I pause is because it's much more complicated than just facilities. And in some cases, and this is not to impugn our school leaders or our school staff, but the behavioral elements of, of school administration are sometimes the hardest ones to influence. Uh, those are the ones where, yes, we have seen a notable drop in the number of doors being propped open across schools, but we do know that it still happens in cases. In some cases, they feel like it's very warranted why they're propping that door open, but they don't really need to. There's another way to go around what they're doing it for. Um, so it's things like that that might take a little bit longer and more, uh, you know, uh, I guess concerted efforts on, on both our part as district leadership, but also school leadership and administration to make sure that we're carrying those things through. But then also making sure that we've got the right buzzer with the camera, the radios, the um, staff coverage and presence. You know, just add, you know, as we draft this standard for school safety and, and again, keeping it dynamic because school safety measures will change over time. Um, you know, I'd like to get to a place where we say we're, we're at 100% compliance mm -hmm. across the district, you know, and of course these exceptions that are often related to human behavior will happen. Uh, we just need to, to get to that point. Um, 
I'd also like to see us get to a point where we have classroom doors that can lock from the inside. Mm -hmm. And you know, every report that I've um, read that's talked about uh, student safety during an active shooter incident has, you know, number one priority has been school doors have to lock from the inside. Mm -hmm. So getting to a point, and I, and I understand it's a financial investment, um, but I'd rather it be a waste of money than something I wish that we had done um, in the past. The Crisis Go app, how much is that? What's the investment in, in that app? I don't know. You don't have to know, right? I think, I, I think it's approximately $40,000 a year, but I have to check That might Mark. be that number. It might be that number. Okay. No, it's not out no, of my budget, no. Yeah, it's, it's in the Office of Instructional Informational yeah, Technology. Yeah, it's in a different office, uh, but we the, can check. Yeah, basically, the IT department is the one that uh, manages that. We can, we can get that number okay. for you. It's not a significant cost of okay. what it does for us. And then does it have the ability, too, to communicate with families? Or could families tap into it in a restricted way? So if something happens at my kid's school, I'm notified of the protocol. What happens if there's an incident with family pickup, with family yeah. reunification, what's you know, what roads are closed going mm -hmm. to my kid's school. Um, accessing um, information about who's where, yeah. because so the, kids yeah. are going in different places. It does have that capacity. When I talked about the individual schools having their own alert, mm -hmm. that would be where I would see families fitting in, and maybe that's the next stage to look at when we get buildings on board because there, uh, there's no maximum to the sign up. Just like everyone that comes to the bowling building or is a, you know, works at the bowling building can sign up for that notification app. Is there a, it just reminds me, um, asking that question, is there a protocol with the Office of Emergency Management or another department on the post-incident uh, protocol? What happens when so in, and in, after and during? Yeah. So we have emergency management preparedness for critical incidents, and it's something we'll be continuing to work on the city on. So the city has their own protocol through BBT, um, BPD and MEMA, but we'll be working to, with the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management to make sure that we know exactly what we're supposed to be doing in that event. So are you not part event. of the protocol yet? So, I mean, our protocol would be that we would be directly connected to BPD, and we would create incident command from that situation. Um, what we would like to see happen is to revisit to make sure that we have our own emergency preparedness that parallels there. So if you look at BPS as kind of a microcosm, say the incident emanates from one of our schools, that everyone knows exactly what their role is, and we're able to pair off with the rest of the city and the systems that we have in place together. Um, so do we, not, we don't have that protocol then with a particular school incident? So we have, we have emergency preparedness and emergency protocol for a school, but if yeah. we're talking about a bigger incident, we need to make sure that we're in line with the city with a citywide protocol. Right. And, and so while we work with them very closely now, I think it's something that we need to articulate through our own professional development and training um, within BPS. And then does every school have um, identified, and maybe not, and that's okay, I, I think it's a place that we need to go towards, um, a ne like the nearest shelter, or where is the place that if there's a pipe bursts in my kid's school, the whole school has to be evacuated. Yep. I don't know actually where I would pick up my kid from, other than the schoolyard, but maybe that's so in, not available. No, so in their individual safety plan, they have two evacuation sites, Rick, yes, that are designated. And it might right. be a community agency, it might be another school in the neighborhood. Yep, yep. okay, very good. And then, um, I just want to make sure that, uh, sorry, bear with me for a quick second. I've got so many notes, so many notes. All right, and then the last thing I have is, um, just a, a few weeks ago, we had a group of students during April school vacation from the Boys and Girls Club come and present to myself and Counselor Flynn about um, some of their concerns about gun violence and their own personal safety. So I, I wanted to make sure, um, I told them that I would bring it up here, and in particular that one of the students brought up the fact, and I think this was maybe an incident at the Condon, God bless you, 
um, that there was a shooting close to their school um, and there was police all over on the outside of the school, not inside of the school. Um, and it concerned the kids. It created some um, anxiety for them, no doubt. I'm sure it created some anxiety for the teacher. But the teacher didn't have any information to share with the kids on what was happening on the outside. So I think that making sure that things that happen in the community are communicated to school staff because there are, you know, potentially 30 ki kids in front of you that are scared and nervous and, and want to know what's happening um, so that we have some sort of communication um, going on in and out, and I think Crisis Go will probably help with that. Yeah, they can yeah. do that. It's also, we're, we're in constant communication with the school leader in a circumstance mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that, and it's really coaching school leaders and supporting them through the operational superintendent on how you do that messaging, right. and we work with crisis response and trauma response at the same right. time about what that message should be. And yeah. then my, a lot, go ahead, John, and just, just real quick, once we have the Crisis Go app uh, up and running at that building level, as Kim had mentioned, across the district, that's exactly how that would roll out. So okay. we would be in touch with the principal so that they know what's going on in the community that principal would then be able to blast a message out right away on Crisis Go that would hit the smartphone of every of every mm -hmm. teacher in the building. They would know right away and then be able to communicate it to, to their children. And then hopefully communicate then eventually with families to say this incident happened outside of the school building, not directly related to um, anything in the building, so families could be um, aware. And just as an added, just an added um, rhetorical question, because I don't, I don't know if it's appropriate for you, but with this conversation, with sort of the heaviness and the important, um, the importance of this conversation, that we are also very much aware of sort of the secondary trauma that our teachers and our school staff feel from just the anxiety. I think the fear and the perceived fear is as dangerous as a real as a real incident. I mean, not as quite as dangerous. Um, but that we're constantly supporting our school staff. You know, when you had your incident, the bowling, the impact that it had on staff in that building is very real. Um, and that teachers, very, and adults in buildings, not just, just teaching staff, but faculty in our buildings feel that in a very real way. Um, and that we're, as a district and as, as a depart school department, supporting teachers and other professionals in our buildings through that. One thing I'd just comment on very briefly, we've mentioned Andrea Amador's name quite a bit uh, in, in tonight's uh, hearing. Uh, Andrea's team of behavioral health uh, plays a critical role when things like that happen, uh, whether it be a safety incident at the school or the loss of a student due to something outside of the school. Uh, that team works so well uh, on the ground with school staff and, and students to make sure that they're transitioning back to some some semblance of normalcy after incidents occur. And realizing that teachers taking care of them, have to take care of themselves, right. but certainly have an adults in the building, I say teachers collectively, um, are also trying to take care of their, their kids, their students at the mm -hmm. same time. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Council CMO. Kim, could you just walk us through the protocol if an outsider does access a school? Uh, without permission, is wandering around, um, and he's and the person is caught. Or um, what? What? What would be the protocol in terms of notifying the police? Or okay, yeah. So what we would do? I mean, there's you know several circumstances, right? Are di different states that individual could be in. What we advise school leaders to do is put the school in safe mode, and that's to stop motion in the school um, to the best of their ability. They call nine one one in safety services. Um, you know, we don't um, deter anyone from calling 911. If it's, we don't want to put staff in a situation where they feel like they can't call 911. If they need to, they should. But they should also, their next call or first call should be to 617-635-8000 safety services. So when there's someone in the building, um, they're gonna stop, they should be stopping motion in the building, alerting their safety team, getting kids and students and staff into safe places identifying the team that's gonna inquire with this individual, and they've already made the call to law enforcement to support, so there's units on the way. Um, there'll be a rapid response to something like that. What we find is sometimes schools like to handle things on their own, um, and we encourage them. Looks wrong, feels wrong, sounds wrong. You have somebody walked in your school that you can't identify. That's a problem, we had one recently, um, early. So there's this before school, after school issue as well. Um, and then there'll be a quick response from Boston School Police and 
even BPD may be quicker, and they'll make the proper inquiries for that individual. And if they can't talk them out of the school, and there's an unfortunate situation that you never want to arrest somebody in a school, but they'll do what they need to do to keep the school community safe. And then any trauma or any exposure that happened during that incident, um, sometimes it's someone that's known to the school community, will again call on Andrea Amador's team to help that school through that issue. A principal is required to um, report these incidents? Are they required to keep a log or are they able to um, handle it on their own? No, they're required to report to safety services. Do you have a number, um, you know, how many incidents this, this has happened over the last year in terms of people accessing the school without permission, walking around, wandering around? I would say under 10. Um, and primarily in the beginning of the school year, I'm probably even under five, we can, we can look at the data. But you know, there is prop doors, warm weather, people pop in, they're identified, they're removed, police are called. Um, there are no serious issues because of that. Um, very low. But oftentimes it might be, you know, somebody that's known to the school community that is acting out within the school. Right. No, thank you for taking my questions. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for that extremely thorough, comprehensive explanation of what we're doing. It's everyone's worst nightmare, obviously, and uh, thank you for your work. Um, at this time, if my colleagues have nothing further, I'll go to public testimony. So you're free to, you know, go back to the the gallery if you'd like. Um, let me call to call three folks up at a time. And there's uh, the podium right there to testify. Brandy, Fluker Oakley, Dan Foreman, Teresa Thalma, Thalhammer. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, honorable city councilors. My name is Brandi Fluker Oakley, and I'm the executive director of Educators for Excellence Boston, a teacher led nonprofit that works to elevate educator voices in the policymaking process. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you tonight about the urgent need to approve the mayor's $2.4 million appropriation for additional school psychologists, social workers, and nurses. At E4E Boston, we surveyed more than 1,000 Boston educators over the course of the 2016-2017 school year. 91% of those educators stated that student trauma poses a major challenge in the classroom. Over the past year, E4E teacher members have worked tirelessly to advocate on behalf of their students and urge BPS to hire more mental health experts. They wrote policy papers, testified at school committee hearings, met with state legislators, and this evening you'll hear from two of them. Unaddressed, student trauma can make learning impossible. Memory, organizational skills, and comprehension are all disrupted by the physical impact of trauma on the brain. Beyond this, the stress associated with trauma causes students to feel unsafe and triggers flight or fight responses at seemingly ordinary occurrences. Schools often respond with exclusionary disciplinary measures and therefore do not address the underlying causes. This is if the student comes to school at all. The National Childhood Traumatic Stress Network notes that students in the older grades who are not receiving emotional and mental health support are far more likely to skip school, contributing to chronic absenteeism. In Boston, 26% of students are chronically absent, nearly double the state average. These students are more likely to fail, repeat a grade, and eventually drop out. Investing in resources that will address these students' trauma head-on is deeply necessary. This appropriation is an excellent start, but it shouldn't be the end of the conversation. The National Association for School Psychologists recommends one psychologist for every 700 students. Based on current BPS data, the district would need to hire 15 additional school psychologists to meet this ratio. The mayor's appropriation will only cover seven additional school psychologists, meaning the district will need to make further investments to ensure that they are fully meeting student needs. There also must be guarantees that these new positions will be student facing, not just employed for testing or administrative purposes. Students need and deserve an opportunity to forge relationships with guidance counselors and social workers who ideally reflect and can relate to their local school community. We encourage the city council to add these guarantees to the appropriation and cement their commitment to students with trauma. 
I urge you to, unclear, Mayor, I urge you to include Mayor Walsh's $2.4 million allotment and provide a much needed increase in the number of school psychologists, social workers, and nurses in BPS. I also urge you to continue to listen to teachers on this issue and let them lead us in the direction of policy solutions that will create a more equitable system for all students. You will next hear from Dan Foreman and Teresa Tallhammer, two EFRI Boston teacher members here tonight to advocate for their students. I will also provide the council with copies of testimonies from Matt Clark and Katie Mallon, two EFRI Boston teachers who were unable to join us this evening but wanted to show their support for the appropriations. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank, I'd like to start by thanking Boston City Councilors for taking the time to hear my testimony today. My name is Dan Foreman and I am a teacher at East Boston High School. I am speaking with you because I am fully aware of the council passing Mayor Walsh's $2.4 million appropriation that will allow the district to employ desperately needed school-based psychologists, guidance counselors, and nurses. As someone who's spent the past 18 years in the classroom, I've seen too many students who live in crisis and experience trauma every day, including homelessness or witnessing and experiencing acts of violence. Nearly two thirds of our students have experienced trauma. The effects of trauma manifest in many ways that hinder our students. Education from chronic absenteeism, feeling depressed or helpless, and coming into contact with the criminal justice system. A few weeks ago, I had a member of the Boston Police Department speaking to students in my criminal justice class. Shortly into his speech, the officer got a call and had to excuse himself to take care of something urgent. He did not return. <clears throat> there was a student who had a gun on campus. They caught, af they caught, after him, af they caught him after a brief chase into a nearby alley. The student left the gun there and the police arrested him as he walked away. I am grateful that no one was hurt but couldn't help but wonder what type of history of trauma this student faced previously. It's unacceptable for even one student to go without the emotional and mental health support he or she needs. Despite, despite my students' incredible strength and resilience, they need to know that someone cares about them and is looking out for them. I commend Boston Public Schools and Mayor Walsh for taking steps to propose this incremental increase in the number of school psychologists mental health support staff, um, which will help us create trauma-informed schools. Our current school psychologist to student ratio in the city is around one to 981. If city council funds this bill, it will get us much closer to the recommended ratio of one to 700. I wanna stress though, that this should not be the last time we talk about supporting students with trauma and creating trauma-informed communities. With roughly 56,000 students in BPS, thousands of kids will remain underserved if we let this be the last time we address this issue. These new mental health experts need to be in schools with kids, not used as traveling crisis group who only re react to events instead of forming meaningful and lasting relationships with students daily. I am urging you today to vote to approve the $2.4 million appropriation proposed by Mayor Walsh and set guidelines to ensure that these funds are used to hire additional staff as intended. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you on this important issue. Thank you. And we are Ju uh, Julie Hurley, Adam Rodow. Hi. Uh, good evening, City Councilors. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my testimony. My name is Teresa Talhammer, and I work as a teacher at New Mission High School. I'm also a member of Educators for Excellence Boston. Educators for Excellence, a teacher-led organization of nearly 30,000 educators based in six chapters across the nation, is dedicated to ensuring that teachers have a leading voice in the policies that affect their students and profession. I'm here today to urge you to approve Mayor Walsh's $2.4 million proposal to add additional mental health experts to Boston Public Schools so that all Boston students, and particularly our most vulnerable, have equitable access to counseling staff and school psychologists. Imagine going to work after you've lost one of your best friends. Now imagine that friend has died in a shooting. Do you think you would be performing at your best, fully focused on your work that day, the next day, even that month? Probably not, right? and neither are my students. Stress and anxiety affect a person's ability to learn. It is therefore critical that students have the emotional support to be able to access and enjoy their learning experience. 
guidance counselors and school psychologists are critical in our effort to provide students with a stable environment for foster, to foster learning. The National Association of School Psychologists recommends a ratio of 700 students per counselor. In Boston, the school psychologist to student ratio is well in excess of this recommendation, but approving the $2.4 million proposed by Mayor Walsh can help us make a significant stride toward closing that gap. This is only my third year of teaching, but I've already had too many students lose friends, parents, siblings, or extended family to violence. We strive to provide a safe environment at school, but we have little to no influence over what happens to our students outside of that safe environment. To help our kids who have experienced trauma grow and learn, we must provide them with tools to deal with the trauma so they're still able to function, to be happy, and to enjoy learning despite of what they've been through. Nearly every teacher has students in a class who have experienced trauma. I'm asking to make sure that all students have access to professionals who can guide them through these difficult experiences some of which include threat of deportation, violent or abusive relationships, homelessness or drug abuse, depression or mental illness. Students are struggling with these and other challenges each and every day. What I've shared today in this short list is based exclusively on what my students and families have experienced over just the last three years of school. As much as I would love to be able to be a teacher, social worker, and psychologist to fully support all of my students, I'm only trained in one of these fields and I serve 70 students. My school makes sure to provide supports for all students by providing access to counselors and psychologists, but it's not easy. We request services from outside institutions and staff often go out of their way and work longer hours to make sure no student goes without the necessary support. Our school is able to provide better than the recommended ratio of counseling staff to students, but not all, all schools have the budget or the staffing, staffing levels to do that, and it's just not acceptable. I'm therefore asking you to approve the $2.4 million for additional mental health experts in the budget for the next school year. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my testimony and for your continued efforts to providing a great education to Boston's Thanks. next generation. Uh, Kate Loftus Camp. Hello, my name is Julie Herlihy. I've worked for the Boston Public Schools for the past 16 years. I was a special educator for 11 and a half years and a school psychologist for the past four and a half years. I am proud to work for the Department of Behavioral Health Services under the leadership of Andrea Amador. My colleagues and I in Behavioral Health Services have been strong advocates during this year's budget discussions for one school psychologist and one social worker in every Boston public school because that is not only what children deserve but it is also what teachers and principals deserve. While I am thrilled that there will be more funds to create additional positions, I am concerned about the testimony previously provided, which seems to suggest that our current staffing levels are sufficient. I would encourage folks to speak with teachers, principals, parents, or nurses that are currently working in our schools to find out if they think we're adequately staffed, because the reality in schools seems to be very different than the previous testimony. Additionally, I would like to share that for the past two summers, I have participated in the Public Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. I attended this yearly institute with teachers, administrators, and school psychologists from all over the country. When folks learned that I was a school psychologist in Boston, they immediately congratulated me on being part of the Comprehensive, Comprehensive Behavioral Health Model, CBHM. It's a model that focuses on prevention and intervention in an urban setting. I felt so fortunate to be a part of this meaningful work. During the school committee's hearings, we heard a little bit about CBH, the CBHM model. However, I am concerned about how it was not mentioned during the last presentation here to the members of the city council. I think that it is very important that the CBHM health model, which is recognized on a national level, be a priority in supporting the social and emotional well-being of our students and our schools. I am grateful and I appreciate your support in making school-based mental health a priority and thank you for listening to my concerns today. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Rodriguez. Oh, Adam. Good evening. Uh, so I'm here tonight to present my own testimony, um, but I think before I do that, I'm also, uh, one of my colleagues was not able to make it tonight, and so I'm going to present on hers as well. 
Um, so the first testimony I'm going to present is from Jessica Chen. She's one of our school psychologists in the Behavioral Health Services. Um, so I'll go ahead and present that now. Um, she writes, my name is Jessica Chen, and I am the district-wide bilingual Mandarin-speaking school psychologist who is assigned to the Condon K-8 in the Roger Clapp School. I'm here this evening to share some of the unique responsibilities of my job and highlight the importance of adequate budgeting for behavioral health services, which, which BHH Behavioral Health Services houses all of the school psychologists and pupil adjustment counselors in the district. In previous testimonies, my colleagues shared about the obstacles that prevent a basic level of direct service delivery within our schools and also limit adequate specialized service delivery to our students with special needs. We have tried to underscore the scope of our training, the breadth of our responsibilities, and the frustration from families and schools when we are unable to meet all of their needs because we are stretched too thin. This evening, I want to highlight yet another unique aspect of our role, mainly our language capacity and the culturally responsive services we are able to provide for students for whom English is not their first language. Behavioral Health Services houses bilingual school psychologists and pupil adjustment counselors who speak the following language or dialects, Spanish, Portuguese, Cape Verdean Creole, Haitian Creole, Arabic, Mandarin Chinese, and Cantonese Chinese. As bilingual psychologists, we are responsible for testing and observing students, interviewing teachers and parents, writing a report, and then supporting families throughout the entire IEP process for each and every student in the district who requires an evaluation in our language. One of the most rewarding aspects of my job is knowing that I can directly connect with Mandarin-speaking families and immediately ease parents' fears about attending an IEP meeting for the first time. Moreover, we are able to explain dense psychological and sociological reports in a familiar native language with a relatable contextual or cultural context. Like most of my bilingual colleagues, we are each also assigned to at least one home school and sit on their prevention and support teams. Throughout this budget season, we are grateful that members of the school committee have joined the collective advocacy of parents, teachers, and researchers to acknowledge the grossly insufficient ratio of psychologists to students in our district. Our hearts swelled when we learned of the $2 million investment from Mayor Walsh towards seven licensed school psychologists and four social workers to move us towards having a more adequately staffed behavioral health services department. I ask that these positions remain student-facing, direct service positions where individuals, individual students can consistently access group counseling, social skills training and check-ins, and school teams can experience the familiarity of licensed and uniquely trained psychologists and social workers for prevention, crisis response, trauma support, and family engagement. In closing, I want to echo the sentiment expressed in last week in the last week in these meetings that those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds deserve the same level of mental health care as other BPS students. I am encouraged that there will be greater attention to hiring bilingual service providers, but as champions of equity, we absolutely must do more to meet the unique needs of these populations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now this is me. <laughs> okay. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the student of, of the city council. So my name is Adam Rudo. I'm a resident of Roxbury. I'm also proud to serve as a school psychologist for the Frederick Pilot Middle School and the King Martin Luther King Jr. K through eight school in Grove Hall. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of my department, Behavioral Health Services, and its effort to increase our capacity to serve the social emotional needs of our students. And I'm also thrilled about the mayor's um, commitment to additional funding for social emotional supports, but I also know that it's important um, to continue to build capacity so our work can expand. Um, and we want to be able to support children in an efficient, targeted way. After coming to the district five years ago, I quickly became aware of the intense needs, social emotional needs of children in my schools. I can summarize essentially a lot of the consultations I had with teachers in my schools by just saying I constantly heard over and over, it's not that these students can't learn, it's that they're not ready to learn. So a lot of the students are coming in, and that makes sense as a psychologist with a lot of needs that are 
far reaching beyond academic. And so that makes a lot of sense to me um, as a psychologist and it's you know exciting. It's part of why I want to do the to go into this is because we as psychologists are uniquely trained to address just those sorts of problems. But there's a catch. This year, for example, uh, due to a lot of the increasing tier three needs of services at my schools, I found myself less able to support kids at a more tier two level. And that means supporting kids, maybe small groups, uh, certain short periods of time that's really targeted towards what they need and really getting them, doing that preventative work. Um, and you know, for teachers, that means you know, it's me turning to them and saying, I'm sorry, I, I'm not running a small group right now for that particular thing, like I did last year, or something like that. Um, you know, sadly, that means some of, a large number of those students are having um, some of those needs unmet, and sadly, I know from experience that I will likely see those students again, and it's going to be when they're presenting with more significant social-emotional needs down the road, because some of that preventative work was not able to occur. Um, just to, as clarification, tier three services include things like IEP counseling and evaluation. So that's some of those role, some of those responsibilities. When they get to the, the level they are for me this year, I'm not able to do some of that preventative work. Um, and one point too I wanted to mention is that, you know, for, for some of our community partners that are also helping support our schools, some of th those, those community partners will cap their caseloads at seeing 20 to 25 students, whereas as a school psychologist, there is no cap. Um, we can often have caseloads much, you know, far exceeding that, in addition to some of our evaluation responsibilities. Um, as psychologists of BPS, we have the expertise, the passion, and the licensure to get these children what they need. Uh, most importantly, we have a leader in Andrea Amador that has the courage, vision, and passion to fight for and find long-term solutions to what can seem like insurmountable challenges. Um, as you've heard, Ms. Amador has, through her efforts to expand the CBHM model, has ensured, and this is so, so special a part of being a, a psychologist in this city, um, she's really ensured that all students are on the radar of school psychologists, and that's the way it should be. Um, not just students who have IEPs or um, more intensive needs, but all students should be on our radar. With Ms. Amador's leadership, the model for expanding tier supports for students is now in 60 schools. We know the model works. We have the data to support that. Um, in order to continue to make that preventative work expand, we need to keep in mind the need to expand the capacity of the Behavioral Health Services Department. And that means growing the number of licensed student-facing psychologists and social workers in our schools. I offer that for your consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having this meeting and being open to hear the feedback from all of us that are here. I'm Kate Loftus Camp, a school psychologist from the Behavioral Health Services Department. I'm here tonight to ask you for your support to ensure the funding for additional school psychologists and school social workers is appropriately allocated in the budget directly to the Behavioral Health Services Department under Andrea Amador. This funding will enable us to continue to pursue our goal of having one psychologist and one social worker for every school in Boston, something that the students and families of this city need and rightfully deserve. Tonight, I have the unique opportunity to share how successful and impactful having a full-time school psychologist in a school can be, because I am humbled and lucky to be the full-time school psychologist at the Donald McKay K-8 in East Boston. Being at the McKay five days a week, I am able to fully utilize my training and expertise in many areas to help every student at my school. Here are just a few things I do each week. Across universal supports, I support teachers in the teaching of our social emotional curriculum second step in every classroom K to eight for all students. I consult with teachers around social emotional learning integration into their other curriculums. I push into two different classes each week to deliver additional lessons around emotional regulation and mindfulness. I consult with teachers around students' behavior to identify that those that might need tier two small group or tier three one-to-one -one services. 
I presented full day professional development to the staff at the McKay on tier one topics such as trauma informed practices, restorative practices, and de escalation techniques in January. I sustain a counseling caseload of over 30 students, which is typical of my colleagues who have two or three schools assigned to them. Beyond that, I am responsible for the referrals of additional services. I have been able to coordinate with multiple community partners and have increased the McKay's partnerships to include two additional full-time counselors and two part-time counselors, as well as group-based therapeutic programming. Because of this, our collaborations, were we are able to provide therapeutic support for nearly 100 students at the McKay, and there are still those in need that we are w working to help. I lead our climate team, which does the work of CBHM through our schools, the student support team, and I participate in grade level team meetings. I'm available for school crisis support and work hard every day to support students and their families by coordinating care through best team evaluations, in-home therapy referrals, therapeutic mentors, and DCF for our students who are in their care. As a member of Behavioral Health Services, I'm also available for in-school and district-wide crisis support and have, been assisting, and have assisted multiple times this year at schools who are coping with loss, violence, and trauma. I would not be able to accomplish half of these things if half of my time was somewhere else. But I'm an anomaly in our department. The students I serve are lucky to have me and I am lucky to serve them. But when the district's initiatives are centered around equity, why can't all of the students in our district receive the mental health support they need and deserve? So that is the challenge I present to you tonight. I just don't want to be an anomaly anymore. Please help us ensure that there is one psychologist and one social worker for every school in Boston. Our students need it. They deserve it. Your time is now. Thank you. Anybody else uh, wish to testify? Oh, okay. I want to say thank you for allowing me to testify tonight, and I also want to thank the mayor um, and apologize in advance. I just created a few notes, so mine isn't going to be as eloquent as my lovely colleagues who were much more well prepared for this today. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit. My name is Nikki Ferrar. I'm a school social worker, pupil adjustment counselor with Boston Public Schools. I've been working for Boston Public Schools since 2006. I was a family therapist prior to coming to Boston Public Schools. And this is my dream job. It's a wonderful place to work. I've been lucky enough to work under Andrea Amador for many years. I also worked as a COSIS a little bit in there, doing special ed. Um, and I wanted to talk about a few things of the social work positions in Boston. Um, as a social worker, I work on the crisis response team, which we heard a little about, do individual and group counseling, home visits, consultation, and teacher trainings in, um, throughout the schools that I work in. This year, I'm assigned to 32 schools within Boston, um, where I provide individual and family group therapy. Uh, no family therapy, individual and group therapy. I'm convinced that if I was more school-based and if the psychologists were more available, many of the students that we work with that go into sub-separate programs would not go into sub-separate programs. They would stay in regular ed or inclusion settings. The reason they go more restrictive oftentimes is because they need more support that's not available in their schools and we come to them at a crisis level versus intervening when they're starting to perk up. And that is not fair to our kids. It's not fair to anybody in the school. It's not fair to the teachers. It's not fair to the principals. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the history with the PACs and that when I came to the district, there were six of us. There was a lot of advocacy that was done in the last union contract. We, with our advocacy and other groups' advocacies, eight more social workers were hired for the district. However, they were put in a different department. So there were two silos of social workers who were being called to the same schools for the same crises, for the same families, and it obviously, of course, didn't work. After two years of them being separate, they were put in our department. I was lucky enough to go from 32 schools to 12, um, which is still a ridiculous number, but it's a much more meaningful number in that you can be present. All the principals knew me, the teachers knew me, they saw my face and knew that I could be supportive to them. That lasted one year, and then the district eliminated those positions. 
Next came the MOVA grant. There were four trauma specialists that were put in each schools. They were in the schools, it was a planning year, and then they were put in the schools for I think one year, maybe two. Again, they were eliminated. Those schools got a taste of what it would be like to have a good social worker who's licensed, professional, and can provide the work, and then they were gone. And that's not fair to our students. We really need to be thoughtful of where these social workers go. I was saddened and shocked to see the presentation last week online and see that they're now, the SEL department's calling them trauma specialists. Um, and my worry is, again, it's gonna be another silo separate from the pupil adjustment counselors who are licensed social workers, and it's gonna be a duplication of services. That's not what's best for our children. That's not what's best for our schools. And I hope that we can address that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie, but I'm going to be reading the um, testimonies of uh, a parent uh, at one of my schools and then another one of my colleagues. Um, so from the parent, I write to you as a parent and co as co-chair of the parent council at the Sumner Elementary School. I'm expressing a great concern the majority of families have in our school. We are dismayed at knowing counselors are being cut from the budget while mo they are most needed in our schools. I want to point out the great need that exists in our schools and in general that provides services to our youth. Personally, I have two daughters at the Sumner School and one of them received services during her first two years at this school. Before that, my eldest daughter, who is a college graduate, was able to buy a home at the age of 24 in part due to the help she received from a counselor while at Madison Park High School. My eldest received help during her rebellious period and with behavioral and focusing issues she had. Today, she is successful due to the help she received by a pupil adjustment counselor, exactly the position that is being cut by the school budget in, our, in behavioral health services. I cannot imagine how many families will negative, be negatively affected by cutting counselors when they are so indispensable. Today, I advocate before you on behalf of all parents who have children in BPS and who need help with different types of problems that only licensed clinicians can help resolve. Why deny them this right? Thank you, Paola Garcia, co-chair of the Parents uh, Council at the Sumner School. I'm now gonna read to you um, the testimony of Alexis St. James. Um, my name is Alexis St. James and I am a school psychologist with the Boston Public Schools, Roslindale, Roslindale resident and BPS parent. I am here to speak today about the need for more school psychologists and pupil adjustment counselors in the Boston Public Schools and the ways in which the current lack of adequate behavioral health services negatively impact school safety. I want to begin by thanking the mayor for his recent investment of $2.4 million to fund eight nurses, seven school psychologists, and four social workers for the children of the city of Boston. While there is no doubt that these positions are an important first step in helping all students get direct support from licensed professionals, those of us who work directly with students every day know that we must continue to advocate for sufficient staff to meet the physical, social, emotional, and behavioral needs of our students. School psychologists and pupil adjustment counselors in Boston are uniquely trained and licensed in bold to identify and respond to the academic, behavioral, and social emotional needs of our students ages three to 21. We also support the important people in our students' lives, such as teachers, administrators, and parents. Our work around school safety focuses on conducting threat assessments, suicide risk assessments, responding to crisis at both dist the district and school level, and coordinating with outside agencies and service providers to ensure a continuum of services for our students. I and many of my colleagues have testified at multiple school committee meetings during this budget process about the lack of staffing in the behavioral service, health services department and the fact that this inadequate staffing hurts our students, families, and school communities. The very bottom line for me is that every day, every school psychologist and school social worker in Boston sees needs in their schools going unmet despite our best efforts. We are simply stretched too thin. As the city at the city council meeting on May 3rd, there was talk of staffing numbers and recommended ratios. I would like to take a minute to clarify these the, the, those numbers from my perspective. From my perspective, perspective, the maximum student to school psychologist 
ratio recommended by the National Association of School Psychologists is one school psychologist per 500 students in high need urban districts, and Boston is certainly such a district. At the beginning of 2017-2018 school year, there were 57.4 student facing school psychologist positions in Boston. Of those, 7.6 were funded by schools from their own budgets. Indeed, several, several schools in Boston have recogni recognized the great need for increased behavioral health services and have taken money from their own budgets at the expense of other positions in order to increase the amount of time that a school psychologist is present in their school. The problem with this with, with positions like this is that they can go away when schools lose funding, as in the case of Brighton High, that has had to cut a school psychology position uh, due to cuts in their budget for the upcoming year. Even when these school funded positions included in this count, wait, I have to make this bigger, sorry. Even with these school funded positions included in the count, this year in BPS there was one school psychologist per 969 students, almost double the recommended ratio. If I look ahead to next year, adding the mayor's recent investment and subtracting positions that are being cut, the, the ratio will be one school psychologist per 897 students. This is still nowhere near the one to 500 recommended ratio. I personally am in three different schools and my ratio is one to 1,200 students. Two of my schools see me only one day per week. Clearly, this is not enough. If school psychologists are truly to address students in schools who are at risk, suffering from trauma or in need of licensed mental health support, we need to be there every day building relationships, earning trust, and functioning as an integral part of the school community. Being a school psychologist in Boston is a job that I am well trained for and one that I love to do, but one that I and my colleagues are unable to do adequately due to the longstanding neglect of the Behavioral Health Services Department in Boston. I'm asking for your support in getting one school psychologist and one social worker per BPS school so that we can meet our students' need and needs and help our students become healthy, accomplished, and individuals despite the obstacles they face. They deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, that concludes today's hearing. John, I want to thank you for spending the afternoon and early evening with us. Kim, thank you for that uh, incredible, thorough, comprehensive um, presentation and, and all your uh, answers that were spot on. I really appreciate it. Um, that, concludes today's hearing. This hearing is adjourned.